our topic today is diversity and inclusion. We all want to be better at encouraging diversity and creating inclusive environments, but how do we do it well? How do we do it so it has a lasting and positive impact on our organizations and people? That's our topic today. Uh, but before we start, a bit of logistics. So this session is going to last between 60 to 90 minutes, depending on the questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A section. That's the bottom, uh, at the bottom of your screen. And I will uh, bring that uh, to the attention of our moderator, Cal Ledwin. Uh, so again, the questions in the Q&A. And we will wrap up at 2.30 or before. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Vanessa Niarco. Uh, Vanessa is a production and shoot manager at Ubisoft Toronto. So Vanessa will introduce the panel on behalf of our uh, keynote partner, Ubisoft Toronto. Vanessa manages the gameplay motion capture shoots and gameplay animation for Fire, Far Cry 6. Uh, you know, I'm saying it and I'm feeling very impressed. Uh, she began her career in the industry as a digital marketing manager for Xbox Canada before transitioning into game development through the Ubisoft graduate program three years ago. After spearheading initiatives such as women in gaming and working with schools to speak on the importance of and opportunity for young girls in gaming during her time with Microsoft, Vanessa is striving to become a producer and first assistant director in game dev. And Vanessa, she wants to do it in order to have an even bigger impact on representation and diversification on and off the screen. Uh, Vanessa is also passionate uh, about writing. She's an aspiring author who aims to one day produce a collection of works from black women in the industry as children's literature for young girls. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Vanessa to introduce the panel. Thanks so much, Lucy. It's an amazing opportunity to introduce my fellow students, peers, and leaders of the industry to the iPrenticeship Diversity and Inclusion panel, discussing how we can better connect gaming and interactive media companies with professionals and young talent in our very own Black community. It is no secret that can feel as though we stand apart in media representation, in company composites, in class cohorts. Being a young black woman and trying to dance a toe into the technology industry, to be honest, I braced for impact. The water was cold and there weren't many fish with faces like mine. And while standing apart became even more apparent, what stood to become a pivotal part of my time in the industry was the willingness of various companies, at times even competitors, to stand together to commit to the outreach of voices just like ours. I've been working in games for five years now, and my time in this feverishly fast moving world has been majorly in thanks to hard work, a keenness to step outside the norms and titles of my major and programs that gave the opportunity to a black young woman with little to no work experience, the chance to respectfully turn this industry on its head. What started as a co-op placement at Xbox led to a contract with the Ubisoft graduate program, which led to managing and shooting all the gameplay animation for the biggest far cry yet. And truthfully, there's still a lot of work to be done in the industry. At times, I feel like a fish out of water. But these placements gave me the opportunity to swim upstream and showed me that sometimes, yes, you'll swim with the sharks, but more often than not, you're among the salmon, pushing each other, climbing together, working towards the same goal, and reaching the top as one. And this is the reason why diversity and inclusion is so important, why these initiatives are so important. It was through the graduate program that I was able to have the opportunity to connect with so many incredible people, including all of you. These programs don't just give newcomers crucial exposure to companies. It lets you connect with a diverse group of people to better understand key perspectives and methods of reaching out to different communities, even within your own workplace, and can show you how to connect with people outside your own circles. That's why it's so special to have panels like these to share strategies and actively participate in discussions and initiatives that include a broader audience. And so I'm incredibly excited to see you all here. My promise to the newcomers is that your hard work will get you there. Your passion will get you there. The industry doesn't want us because we have long stood apart. This industry needs us because we are born to stand out. 
My message to all of us already in the working in the industry is that we must get there together. We have the power to change the way stories are told, but we have to be willing to include new chapters. I, for one, am looking forward to blazing the way for truer, newer stories of all the brilliant colors that make up the industry with each and every one of you. We hope you gather invaluable takeaways for making your workplace that much more inclusive for your current and future team members. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for today's panel, whose work in video games and interactive media has turned the tide since 2009. CEO and founder of Northern Arena Productions and Northern Arena Inc., a TV and interactive production company and one of Canada's biggest esports organizers, creator, producer, lecturer, and radio and TV personality, Carl Edwin Michel. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, um, my name is Carl Edwin Michel. Um, and welcome to the I Apprenticeship uh, Career Fair for uh, Emerging Black Professional and Students. So um, I would like, uh, obviously, to start by uh, thanking uh, our presenting partners, uh, like Lucy said a little bit earlier, uh, the Ontario Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, Ubisoft Toronto, and our keynote partners, Ontario C Creates, Canada Media Fund, and the Bell Fund. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, the KPIs of uh, DNI, uh, impactful strategies for investing in diversity and inclusion. And I uh, would like to introduce our panelists right off the bat. Let's uh, let's start with uh, Marsha. Marsha Ford. She's the director of global inclusion, diversity, and talent development at Will, uh, Wild Brain. Hi, Marsha. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, Leon Winkler, uh, Director, International Event at Ubisoft HQ. Hello, Leon. Hello, everyone. And Naveen Mehta, Chief Legal Officer at Mesh Diversity. Hello, Naveen. Hey, everyone. So I uh, would like to give you a little bit of uh, time just to introduce yourself. And I think we're going to start with Marsha. Um, Marsha, just tell us a little bit more about you and, uh, and what you do at Wild, uh, Will Brain. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Just as you said, um, I do lead uh, global inclusion, diversity, and talent development at Wild Brain. Um, and for those who don't know, Wild Brain is a media production and brand licensing company with a focus on children's content and programming. So we have a lot of motivation for getting inclusion and diversity right, obviously for our employees um, and making sure we're creating um, inclusive and equitable spaces but also for the impact that we have globally on children and families. Good, and uh, Leon? Well, hello, I'm Leon and I work for Ubisoft. I've been working for Ubisoft for 15 years, uh, responsible now for the international events like E3 in a normal year, Gamescom, but now since the pandemic hit hard and messed up the world, um, we do Ubisoft Forward on top of that, we started this initiative called the Black Game Pros Mixer, which we actually just finished just before this seminar started. Uh, an initiative basically to, to foster, foster and, and get more representation within our industry because we really believe that there, even though our, the intentions are there, there's still a long way to go. Cool, Leon. And fun facts, I think you said 15 years. It is today, I think. Yeah, the it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not today. I just posted something today because I wanted the cloud. Uh. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, this year is going to be my 15th year at Ubisoft. Hence the, old, the, the gray beard and all these things. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. And, and obviously, Naveen, um, tell us a little bit more about you. Thanks, Carl. Um, so I spent 20 years as a, and I'll sort of very quickly how I got to where I'm at. I spent 20 years as a litigator and general counsel uh, for a large Canadian organization. So as a lawyer, and during that time, I was also the director of human rights. And there was this fundamental frustration that evolved as a human rights lawyer and, and a DNI practitioner it was this idea that, um, you know, we can go into organizations, we speak about DNI, and then we leave, and nothing changes. And so I left that role to join Mesh specifically to be able to engage organizations so that we can actually utilize tools such as technology to drive sustainable um, diversity and inclusion initiatives. And really, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, we're, we're you know we can use more direct language now. You know, we're talking about anti-oppression, anti-black uh, blackness, anti-black racism, anti-racism generally. Um, and so we're at a really cool point in time where, you know, the recognition is happening. People are engaging these ideas. Yeah. It's at the cusp of doing great things. 
This is great. Um, well, great. Let's let's get into the meat of it. And and just before uh, I want to say to the audience, obviously, if you do have questions for the panelists, please uh, go to the Q and A section and ask your uh, your question. Uh, Lucy is going to uh, uh, take the best uh, the best questions or the, the questions that are you know fitting with the uh, with the discussion, and then just uh, ask them uh, to the panelists. So that's. Uh, going to be really interesting and let's let's start right away uh the first question uh that i have for for you guys is uh there's a lot of company listening uh who want to uh, increase black representation uh on their uh, on their teams and have other diversity goals uh can each of you share something you have done or or are trying to do within your companies and uh, something you've you've learned in the process and, and maybe i'll start with marsha on that one um, sure, happy to start. Um, so I think when we uh, talk about increasing diverse talent, that really feels to us like an outcome. Um, it's an outcome of doing what we think a lot of things right. So day in and day out is running your business in an inclusive manner. So for us, we really needed to pause and think about that. And what we started with was uh, speaking with our employees. Um, and we did that through an inclusivity survey just to understand how did people feel in that moment? Did they feel like they belonged? Did they feel like they could raise questions or concerns? Were we making space for that? So that was kind of um, the first place where we started. Um, alongside that, the second thing we did was really work um, together with the senior management team, just to make sure that everyone was aligned on the importance of diversity and inclusion and that education and alignment is really what got everyone committed to say, yes, we need, we need to do this um, and to really be committed to that cause. Um, and then I'd say the third piece, we did a little bit later, but was very important, was looking um, almost like the analogy of like raising the, the hood of your car and just really looking at the policies, the programs, kind of those systemic structures that are there to uh, figure out um, you know, what's going right and where are the areas where maybe we're creating barriers for underrepresented groups. Um, and we did that with a, an external partner, a consultant, because of course we needed to do so objectively. Um, but this process for us was very important because we knew that it was the foundation for us to build um, a longer term plan and to make sure that we were building um, an inclusive space. Because um, what we don't want to do is jump to hiring, bring in um, diverse talent, and once they arrive within our organization, it doesn't feel inclusive, they don't feel like they belong, and then all the effort we've made um, is, is for naught, really. That's great. Um, Naveen, do you want to add to to this? Marsha makes a great point in that when you're building you know, when you're building that culture, you know, there's, there's this idea of um, just bringing people on board. Uh, we're just going to bring, we're going to bring uh, a certain percentage of people from this, from this group. We're going to bring a certain percentage of black folks, a certain percentage of women on. Good to go. Problem solved. The dilemma is, is that unless we're really concentrating on the culture build, people leave, right? We have to fo focusing on that ecology is so important. Um, I work with a lot of law firms and in, you know, when I graduated law school uh, 20 years ago, half of the graduating class uh, was women. So half of the people entering the profession were women. Uh, in most law firms and across the profession, by the time you get up to partner, senior partner, uh, equity partner, you're down somewhere near about 30%. So women leave. So what that tells us is either a legal profession um, just believes that women can't work in these roles that they're just not competent enough, or there's a systemic sexism problem. The same thing goes with regard to uh, racism as well. So building that ecology where when, when people come on board, we get rid of those systemic barriers is fundamentally important that they can actually thrive in that space, right? And that if we don't do that ecology build, people just leave and we, we're not any, any further ahead. Um, in answering your, your question directly, you know, um, the work that we do uh, at Mesh is sort of pinpointed on, uh, you know, focused on using technology data uh, and metrics to drive this forward. So we're not just utilizing intuition, what feels good. Um, you know, and the example I always use is that people uh, tend to look at the underlying issues of, of, of social oppression, oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, and so forth as these are just things bad people do. 
you know, and as Canadians, one of the most wonderful things we like to do is say, this is the stuff that happens with the people south of the border. You know, racism is about the guys with the pointy hats, the guys who wait outside, bar, outside a gay bar to beat someone up. That's, that's what homophobia is. And understanding that um, from a systemic perspective, that it's built into the DNA of how we operate as an organization, it's built into uh, the operation of a society. As soon as we're able to sort of expose that for folks, we're able to then really start the planning. It's as opposed to it's a nice to have, it's, a, it's fundamental. And so in engaging um, organizations, engaging uh, uh, you know, social oppression, how do we actually respond to that? Um, one thing that we do, I think uh, what we're able to do is ensure that uh, we're, we're concentrating, circling back to that ecology build. I, I have the pleasure of working with um, the Black North Initiative in, in, in uh, heading up their metrics uh, committee. And the Black North Initiative, if, if there's companies out there who haven't signed on, go now, leave this, go now and sign up, become a signatory, because it's so fundamentally important. And, and the goal there is to get 3.5, one of the pledges is to get 3.5% of your leadership should be uh, Black by 2025. That's a long, it's a long window. It's a lot of time to build, build that up. But again, what we're doing with the Black North Initiative is to ensure that those same companies that want more Black folks uh, in every level of their business, want to ensure that they have the ecology so that Black people actually stay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Naveen. And, and Leon, I think you uh, you can answer the question, and I'm sure you're going to talk about the Black Mixer here. <laughs> yeah, my, my position is a little bit different in this because, I mean, first and foremost, I applaud the work that both of you have been doing because that's really amazing. Um, I don't work in policies within Ubisoft. I mean, we just hired a VP of uh, diversity and inclusion who was working on the policies within Ubisoft Global to make sure that we as a company become more diverse and more representative. What I started in 2019 together with, uh, with some of the co-founders is the Black Game Pros Mixer. And it came from the initiative that, I mean, I've been working in the industry for so long um, and it's still, there is a issue or a challenge when it comes to representation, seeing people out there that look like you. Um, and especially when I move my way up in, in, the, in the ranks within Ubisoft, now director of international events, I was like, wow, do we really need to do better? Um, since I'm a very like hands-on kind of person, since I do all the events, um, I was like, well, we do E3, uh, we have this location, why not leverage this and do something specifically aimed at doing something for, for, for the black people out there, for the black people in the, in, the, in the industry. And at first the idea was, okay, let's do something around cosplay, black cosplay, because I was inspired by the 28 days of, of black cosplay that is happening right now. Um, but since that was a little bit too niche, it was like a niche within a niche. I mean, we were like, okay, let's, let's do it a little bit bigger and let's, and let's leverage this location that we have to invite all the black folks that come to E3 to either do their work, their work, or just to get inspired, or all these kind of things, and that kind of resulted in the first edition of the Black Game Pros Mixer. Um, at first, we did we did live events, uh, which was cool, but then at a certain point in time, we had to pivot towards digital events, which were easier to do, and also generated a bigger audience. Now, all that being said, um, for me, I, I'm I'm kind of like one of those people, like like I said, I like to get my hands dirty. I like to make sure that I at least contribute to the extent that I can and with that hopefully inspire the people around me and within Ubisoft I mean not saying that what I did was the sole inspiration for Ubisoft but I think it's a it's a piece of the a piece of the puzzle that contributes to the process that we now hired a VP of diversity and inclusion because we saw that hey we need to do better so here we are there you go uh, thanks Carladrin is it uh, we do have a few questions and uh, one of them directly for Leon so uh, Leon, I think you just answered it, but maybe you, you can add more. Uh, so it's from Megan. I think Leon mentioned a Ubisoft initiative to hire or include black employees, is that right? Where can I find more information on this? Thank you. All right, well, thanks for that question, first and foremost. Um, so we do have this initiative, indeed the Black Game Pros Mixer, which is not per se uh, a, a initiative or a seminar to get people to join Ubisoft, even though yes, that would be great. It is more an inspirational kind of session where we put a spotlight on, on diverse profiles within the industry, not only Ubisoft employees, but it could be someone from Sony, from Microsoft, which we had in the past, 
uh, talking about basically how they came within their job, how they how they how they how they grew within their job, and how they basically started, and uh, where they started, how they got started, and how they got where they are, and hopefully with that inspire people to join the industry. I mean, and following I think the edition that we did last year, we started a Discord, the Black Game Pros Discord, which you can join. Um, where indeed we also post more like HR opportunities and these kind of things, job postings. But it's kind of like a now kind of like a self-animating society or or community of, of black game professionals uh, uh, talking and sharing knowledge and information, which was basically the idea that we had in the beginning. Because what I saw when we started was that there was nothing really out there. Not I mean, yes, there were local initiatives. You had something in the states. You had something in Canada. There was something in Europe. But there was nothing really bringing it all together, and that's what we were, are trying to do, like bring this global community of Black people working in the industry together to share knowledge and hopefully also in, with that increased representation within our industry. And you mentioned something that is a great segue to uh, Zoe's question. You mentioned a VP of diversity and inclusion. So Zoe's question is for all of you. What are the top skills that emerging diversity professionals should have in 2021? Who wants to answer first? I would be happy to take a crack at that. Um, you know, we've been doing in the US diversity and inclusion work for 30 years. In Canada, for about 15 years, everything has picked up uh, since the murder and torture of George Floyd. We're still having these conversations. It's, these are not simple approaches. What's fundamental for DNI professionals is you know looking at the end result and the end result is how is this going to change um, the behaviors of my people, my leaders, uh, senior managers, people leaders, frontline staff, how are their behaviors going to change? And when we start to do the assessment of the so-called traditional best practices that we've been doing for 30 years, remember that, that definition of insanity, keep doing the same thing over and over again, if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, how do we expect to get a different result? We have a vast body of social science, social sciences out there that tell us how do you change people's behaviors? How do you change that um, with regard to not only just how they engage each other, but how they assess a situation? And unless we start to look at what is the outcome here, how am I going to, uh, unless we sort of really dig down deep on and looking at outcomes with before we put in practices, I think that connection needs to be there. Because if we don't have that, we're just doing the same thing over and over again. The other, the other key piece, and I, I, I'm, I'm blessed in that, you know, we get to work with DNI professionals across North America, like chief diversity officers and CHROs, in that, you know, we judge ourselves by our intent and the world judges us by our impact. Most people are good. Most people do not wish malice and hate towards others. They wanna to live in an equitable society. And I could, as someone who has suffered, you know, dealt with all sorts of racism in his own life, I still believe that. I think here's where the dilemma is, is that our intentions are up here. You know, the example I always use is, I make up a fictitious person, Fred from accounting. Fred, do you like working with South Asian people? Love the South Asians, they're great. My uncle's aunt's cousin is South Asian, wonderful, and you might get a good nod for the food. The dilemma is, is that Fred, have you ever hired a South Asian person? You've been in management for 25 years. Do you, work, do you ever hire a woman? And the impact is down here. So really for, for, for DNI professionals, understanding that intent impact gap is fundamental to underlying the understanding of, of programming going up. And so that big, that sort of elephant in the room is, if I don't have a clear outcome that is measurable, not that I think is better, I think things are gonna be better, but unless it's measurable, unless you put metrics, behavioral metrics to it, um, we start to have gaps in our process and our systems in, in attacking anti-black racism, sexism, and homophobia. Hmm. This is great. Um, Lucy, can I continue? You have uh, other questions. 
I have others, but please continue and uh, I'll jump in Perfect. later on. If, if, if I may, if oh, I may yeah. share if I may share something, because I forgot to mention for the person asking Black Game Pros Mixer, do we offer jobs? Uh, or do we also talk about that? Is that a way of getting into the industry? We do in actually in Toronto or in Ontario, we have the uh, Black Youth Apprenticeship, which we are doing, of course, with Interactive Ontario, which is a way to also get into the industry. So just keep that in mind. Just wanted to put that out there for those uh, based out of Toronto or out of Ontario that want to join. Well, perfect. Leon. That's that's a perfect segue because I was about to talk about understanding uh, commitment to change and impact on DNI. And as a Black Youth Action Plan organization, uh, Interactive Ontario is committed to supporting learning and pathways to employment in the video game interactive digital uh, media industry and, and want to make an impact. So my question to you uh, guys is what does it mean uh, to commit to diversity and inclusion? And maybe we'll start with uh, Leon. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's a personal commitment. Once again, I don't lead the policy at Ubisoft for diversity and inclusion. For me, it's, it, has, it has always been a personal commitment to leverage the position that I have to, to, to give back. I mean, I think, and that's maybe, I mean, that's just me talking, but I think there's there are a lot of people out there that might become successful and then forget about where they came from. I try not to do that. I try to leverage the position that I have, the knowledge that I gain, the expertise that I have to give back and hopefully inspire slash educate slash motivate uh, the young generation out there to join so that in the future, there will be more people that look like me or like us in general. Hmm. Marsha? Yeah, I would say personally, um, what I found really helpful as far as kind of starting that commitment um, was that we had a couple of uh, champions amongst our leadership team who were already putting initiatives in place kind of quietly um, to attract and hire diverse um, talent um, kind of um, in front and behind um, the screens um, in writing rooms and whatnot. Um, and then once we aligned with the leadership, um, this really, we really didn't look back after that. And so I think part of commitment is accountability. So what are we going to do? And for us, that looked like setting up regular cadence um, to, to coming together to have the conversation. So there is a biweekly kind of diversity senior leadership team that meets um, and they, they meet really consistently. Um, the meeting comes from our CEO um, who is present and engaged. Um, so everyone shows up and contributes um, soon after our conversations and we realized what task was in front of us. Um, you know, I, I commend the organization on um, allocating a resource specifically to this work, um, not unlike Leon. Um, and then uh, I would say beyond that was communicating um, throughout the organization. And one uh, kind of key initiative we did was we implemented uh, diversity and inclusion committees. And so these are um, employee run um, committees um, with uh, groups across um, our company globally. And um, I don't say it enough, these committees are incredible. So I thank them if anyone's watching, um, but just the work and the contribution and the effort and the passion, and they really challenge us. So that commitment, um, it's yes, that we're gonna do all these things, but having that accountability um, to support those groups and to make sure we're coming back to employees, I think has really helped us um, stay the course. That's great. Um, Naveen, uh, on, you, on your side? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in answering that question, what does it mean to commit to diversity and inclusion? What does it mean to commit uh, to social oppression, um, anti-racism? You know, a starting point, again, depending on the size of the company, you know, is having a Marsha on board for, you know, some for starters, uh, doing what U Ubisoft is starting to do. Um, but then when you go beyond that and you have these great people there, is applying the same degree of rigor that we do to every other area of, of our business. So, you know, organizations will tell you time and time again, diversity and inclusion, go to the, just go to the company's website, type in diversity and inclusion, this is a pillar of our organization. Everyone should be treated equally. And then some organizations that they might be connected to or involved in, and maybe some programming. If it's a pillar of your organization, that means it's up here, right? It's not down here where the company golf tournament is, but oftentimes the company golf tournament gets 
you know, gets treated with more of an assessment, more rigor than, than DNI. Yeah. So if it's a pillar of our organization, making sure that it's fundamental, one, that it's, it's resourced properly, um, that it has the expertise um, that it requires, and that we're not just, you know, involved in sort of um, uh, lip service. We're not just sort of not performative uh, uh, events. You know, in my in my old role, I, I found that at a certain point doing DNI, I was like the expectation was you're just a glorified um, event planner. And so, how, again, how do we how do we utilize that to drive uh, behavioral change going forward? Because you know those social oppressions that occur outside the door, we all know occur and are deeply entrenched inside the doors of our businesses. So um, committing to it means having very uh, honest engagements uh, and utilizing the science and technology and, and, and uh, social sciences available so that we're doing a deep dive. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and uh, how do you make sure and for you for guys, you guys. Or, or in general, that it's not just a checkbox, like, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we're doing DNI and, and it's not just like a fad. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go uh, to you, Naveen, right away, just, uh, just because you, you already answered. But uh, what, do you, what do you do um, on your side um, to make sure that it's not just a checkbox or just a fad? Sure. sure. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll use the example of um, unconscious bias training. All the rage, right? Everyone and their uncle has been gone through some sort of unconscious bias training. But going back to my previous sort of example with regard to, is it scientifically validated? So unconscious bias training is, is about awareness. For instance, as something to do. People feel like I did something. I'm now aware that I have 280 plus uh, biases. They all, they're all operating within us right now. They're under the radar. We can control and mitigate almost none of them. That was your unconscious bias training right there, right? So doing things like that, where we get awareness, it's really about driving, again, as I said, behavioral change so that we're actually learning in our, sh so if information is going to our short-term memory and then to our long-term memory. So it becomes habitual. So you think about how um, certain communities are raised when they see people of color, when they see black folks, they, they think threat. And we know that because society has told them time and time again through imagery from the day they're born. There's a way to deprogram that. And there's a science to it. There's a science to, um, uh, to inclusion. But we just need to be able to adopt that and take those, uh, take those approaches. If we're going to do things like, you know, ERGs, as Marshall pointed out, fantastic. We need to make sure they're, they're properly resourced. You know, otherwise, ERGs can just become environments where we go, what are we, what are we supposed to be doing here if nobody's listening? Um, uh, you know, at, at the far end of the spectrum, some companies, some large, uh, you know, organizations that we start to work with, they, they're having ethnic lunches as a way to pacify people. These are things that we know are not going to work. So if the, the mental gauge is, how is this going to result with it, you know, uh, in behavioral change? Because our behaviors are really, all those individual behaviors make up our culture. How is this going to result in individual behavioral change? That's the gauge to determine um, whether or not this is a tokenistic approach. It's a, it's a one-off. I noticed in one of the questions, someone asked, listen, I, I was in an organization, I was the one, right? And there's this concept of the one, the one, the one, the one black person, the one uh, person of color. How do we get over that so it's not tokenistic? And so a way in which we do that is when we're doing that cultural build and we're giving people the ability to actually measure their intent versus their impact, right? And so that they have a very clear roadmap on what they need to work on. Think of it like a, a student's individual education plan. So they have a very clear roadmap. You lose that idea of tokenism in that we just, because if you just have a one, the one just means, okay, we can just point to the one and make everybody happy, job, job done, mission accomplished. And so you move, you move beyond that by doing, you know, having real cultural change and it takes time. There's no, there's no sprints. It's all a marathon because we're dealing with the most complicated species on the planet. That's great. Um, I think, Marsha, if you, you want to answer about, you know, the, the fad versus, you know, checkbox uh, and how do you guys uh, deal sure. with that? Sure. I mean, I think maybe, um, as I mentioned earlier, I would say communication across the organization so that it becomes not 
just an HR initiative. Like, I think that's a huge danger where people are thinking, oh, HR has got this. <laughs> um, and I would say even further, yes, um, the executive team has a huge role, but it can't just be the executive team either. So kind of communicating that through the organization and on an individual level, helping people understand, you know, how they can navigate their world and their work through, um, you know, in a more inclusive way. Um, and then the other thing is um, talking about the deep dives is just, you know, when you look at things like um, your values um, and the, just like the way that you do work is making sure that they show up there. So it's not, you're not just seeing it once when you kind of look over at the, you know, diversity and inclusion policy that you're seeing it on an ongoing basis and you're talking about it. And then that communication, again, I think is what holds you accountable. Hmm. Beyond? Oh, how can I follow all this up? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, once again, just talking how I work and how I do what I do, uh, I just keep on going. I mean, ticking boxes, and for me, it's 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 part of my life. I mean, I mean, it's, it's and especially like I said, my my job is to do events. So indeed, <laughs> to to link to what Naveen said earlier, it's like maybe yeah, it's like we started as event managers and we turn into D and I uh, people or certain or something like that, but. I, I try to I try to inspire by doing, and I try to hopefully also inspire the higher ups by doing these kind of things, so that they see that it's not just tech, that it's checking boxes, but it's actually it's the important thing because it's driven by passion, it's driven by by emotion, and it's not driven only by facts and numbers. Even though yes, we need more numbers, but mm. the reason why we're doing this is, or the reason why I am doing this, is because I feel a certain way. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, thank you. And I want to jump into um, cost. I'm going to ask that question directly to you, Naveen. Um, can, can you talk about the cost of implementing diversity and inclusion policies um, and training? And, and also, what is the cost of not doing it? Sure. I, I, like, the, I like the second part of the question much better. Um, you know, like, like any, any pillar of our organization, there's, there's, a, there's a financial cost, there's a resource cost. Um, there's a time cost um, for folks. If we're going to really look at uh, anti-oppression, DNI, ensuring that we build workplace cultures where everybody can thrive, we've got to think of this um, as basic, as foundational to organizations, not just say that it is. You know, the notion that um, we're just going to train people. And we just we do this as adults throughout, you know, in a variety of years. If you're figuring out, for instance, how to put together a, a rowing machine, you just need instructions and you can do it. It's done. This is far more complex. So bringing someone in like myself, you hear my voice, very passionate. It's exciting. You're going to be inspired. And then what? So the key is, is that if you're going to, again, it's learning over time. It's those small chunks of information, all the science sort of points towards that. Um, with regard to cost, um, you know, organizations, there's, there are an immense number of things organizations from a small, you know, startups with five people can do that cost next to nothing that can bring in experts. And then if, if you're committed to an ongoing change, if you're a large organization, bringing in experts uh, like Marsha, bring them onto staff. So you have that expertise with you. You can have, you have a quarterback, you have someone who can run your mission control to drive those, those changes going forward. The other side of that coin, and let's take morality out of this as a human rights lawyer, let's take that hat off. And let's just look at this from a purely business perspective. One tweet can demolish your market cap. One tweet that goes viral, one Instagram post, that says, this organization treated me this way. And here's a video. This is how they talk at this organization that I used to work at, right? Your brand is everything as a business and people will diminish that overnight. You know, think about Volkswagen and their, their, the fiasco with regard to their fuel. They lost billions in market cap and it took years to build that back. What do you say to your shareholders? What do you say to your shareholders when, you know, when the, the last DNI thing uh, event we did was we just brought in a speaker 
and we're a hundred million dollar company. So it's it's really about um, uh, there's an, and that's just that's just think about that in the narrow silo of a financial cost of a business. Then you connect that to how do I how do how are my employees feeling? I'll give an example. There's a large uh, U.S. bank that's one of our clients, and when George Floyd was um, was murdered and tortured, and I think it, for me it's important to say it that way because that's what how you didn't just die. And when that happened, the CEO, as one of our clients, white man, said to us, uh, "This is what's happening to me. Our uh, our employees who are black are being traumatized for the thousandth time." Our uh, white employees want to be good allies. They have no clue what to do. So it's just easier for them to do nothing. And our leadership, really, we don't have a clue. That type of leadership that is, that type of organization that's invested in their people and then took, took steps very quickly. That type of organization is an organization that thrives, that allows for its people to work at its best. You know, we all have this idea of, if you have a, if you have a micromanaging boss, how do you like part of your bandwidth is always like, oh, what is this dude going to say today? What is he going to say today? And that eats up your bandwidth. So you're not as from a pure from a company's perspective, you are not focusing on your job. So if you can alleviate that pain and you can start to focus on your job because you're bringing your your best self to work, you are in an environment where you can thrive and you see a roadmap going forward. That's a company that will be productive, creative, and you don't have to trust me. You can trust the over two, two to three, I think it's 2,600 surveys, sorry, studies that support that notion. That's great. Um, I wanna to jump to another question because um, it's important. So obviously all those companies, if they wanna do something, what are the actions uh, a company can take when it make uh, when they're making short term goals and, and versus long term goals uh, when implementing DNI and um, I'll jump to Marsha on that one. Sure, um, you're right. It's overwhelming, um, and I think it sometimes feels like you just don't know where to start. Um, I'll share kind of a, a concept that our our partners shared with with me um, at Ernst and Young when we were working with them, and they talked about. Um, kind of looking at, at the, the rocks and the boulders. So if you think as the boulders is the really big initiatives that you know you have to get done, they're going to take time, they're going to take money, resources, um, you know, like reevaluating your talent acquisition process, um, or, you know, implementing or capturing diversity data, you may have to, you know, buy a new human resources um, information system to get that done. Um, but what are the things that you can do right now and today? And those are the, the rocks or the pebbles or the little things that we can ask each person on an individual, individual level of what you can do. What can I start doing differently tomorrow? And those things, I think particularly for leadership um, are things like, you know, just kind of pausing and reflecting, like, how do I conduct my team meetings? Who are the people on my team who I'm hearing from all the time, you know, yeah. and they're contributing ideas? What about that other person who's being a little bit quiet? There could be a whole host of reasons for that person who's being quiet. So um, the pebble or the rock in that situation is, is changing um, your team meeting and how you do that. Um, or, you know, what voices are we elevating, you know, and celebrating the work, you know, underrepresented groups, maybe their work isn't being showcased as much. So I think just shift, shifting those little things on a day to day basis. Um, for me, I'm, I'm completely guilty of when I need help or support, I run to, you know, the people that I always run to. And likely those people are all like minded, we have similar ideas. Um, and I'm missing out on a whole bunch of ideas by not, um, you know, looking into the business for other ideas for, for um, diverse perspectives and experiences. So I'd say think of it that way. Absolutely, you have to do the big things, um, but don't get stuck and held up because it's too big. Um, think about those little things that you can change. Hmm. Leon? Um, well, I mean, I, th I think it's more of a policy kind of question once again. So it's, it's not really on um, my, I think it's uh, for me to speak on this. I know that, like I said, we, we, we just hired our new VP Rashi to work on these kind of things. Okay, how can we make sure to implement this in the right way within the company? All that I can say and all that I'm doing, all that I can do from my perspective is 
keep up the initiatives. I know that what we started with the mixer resulted or led to an ERG that was created, which led to other things that are being created. I think if, for example, in a situation, if you were working at a company and there might not be a VP of diversity and inclusion, what can you do? Start yourself. I think, I think that's one of the things that you can, you can already put some things in motion yourself by just starting somewhere, having a conversation with your leadership and like, hey, this is important for this and this reason. Um, and I mean, I, I am sure they will listen to you. Any good manager should. Great, thank you. And actually, it, it leads me to to another question. Uh, talking about talent and and the company culture, uh, um, many people listening uh, may not be in the position to implement policies, uh, but want to see their employers uh, making meaningful changes um, to the company culture. So, do you have any advice <clears throat> for where to start um, or how to to be successful in impacting uh, the executive uh, decision uh, makers? So. Um, Maybe Naveen, you can you can answer that one uh, to start. So that's 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 a tough question. Whenever it's asked, because you can you can frame it as, folks. I know you're in your second year. You're the one BIPOC employee out of a hundred people. Have some courage. It's all on you. Go talk to go talk to your CEO. It's tough. It's tough when you're in that position, and you and you got to remember the history of race. The history of sexism, these are histories of power. And unless we start to understand those power dynamics, it's really difficult for someone in that position to move forward. I'll give you, you know, if I were to go to a bus stop and I would go, go to a, you know, a, a white man older and say, listen, sir, do you, have, do you have the time? And he were to look at me and go and roll his eyes and walk away. A couple of things happen. I go, He's a jerk. He's having a bad day. I have the additional layer of saying, maybe he's racist. Maybe, is it something I'm weird? Do I look too brown? Like, is it, and I'm processing. I will continue to process that until I forget it. It's almost better if that person had said to me, listen, you F and B, because I know he's a racist. So when you're processing that and you're processing microaggressions and you're in an organization and you're at the junior levels and you're the one or the two or the five, saying that you need to go and talk to leadership, I think is, is, is an unreasonable request. One of the things we can do, and it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a meek approach because leadership, leader need, leadership needs to lead. They're at the top. They are the power dynamic. Uh, they are the barrier. And so if you're on an entry level, what you can do is start to engage your own understanding. Start to build up your own expertise so that when you see things, you have a very clear understanding. What we assume as well is that if you're a woman, you are the spokesperson for, for feminism. If you're a person of color, based on your lived experience, you know how to drive people forward. And you, know, and, and you know everything there is about racism, the history, how it operates, how it manifests itself, and how to fix it. So I think that the dilemma is that the personal, I think for the individual at the, at the lower levels of an organization, it's, and it's sort of an impotent answer, but trying to build your own understanding so that when you do engage in those conversations in the workplace, that you're able to deal with the myriad of responses that aren't based on any social science, they're just based on people's intuition, what they feel like. Carl Edwin, can I interrupt? Because there are several questions. Or, so in fact, that's coming from an employer who really wants to hire uh, a diverse team. So the backstory, uh, they're a small company in frequent hires, fully remote company, even before COVID. In the past, they've done phone chat interviews uh, no video, not in person, and they hired based on experience, portfolio, and any referral information that uh, they got. So they don't know uh, what some of their employees look like when they do this. Is it okay? Are they missing an opportunity? What more could they do to make sure that diverse candidates see their posts? And a follow-up question, 
it seems wrong to the person asking to ask the employees to identify themselves as belonging to a minority group. But at the same time, she's asked to report this information uh, to the provincial and federal funders. What is the legality around it? I mean, I'm happy to kind of um, give it a go on the, the first part of that question. Um, I would agree with you um, at the end of your question, you kind of said, where should I be looking for talent? And I would say that's the place where you should start. Um, you know, you spoke about um, hiring people um, into your organization who you haven't um, seen. And I, I think that's absolutely fine. I think the emphasis needs to be placed on your, you know, the, the whole front end of your process. So starting with, you know, what is the job description that you've, you've put out there? Um, is it a job description that maybe is already deterring people from applying based on the language that's being used in the job posting? Um, and then following up with um, where is it that you're going to source for candidates? Um, you know, I think we're all guilty of, you know, having had a certain way that we hire, or we just post on our website or we, we post in one or two similar places. And I think you really need to cast that net out wider based on um, the talent that you're looking to attract. Um, and then I would take it, you know, a third step is, you know, when you start to engage in that interview process, what is that process? Who's involved? Um, and what are the questions that you're asking? Again, checking for language and appropriateness. You know, are you asking for things um, or skills that actually are not that relevant to the role just because you've always asked them? Um, or is this, is this now the time to say, what are the other industries or the under, other skill sets that could lend themselves well to this opportunity? Because I think all of that work that's happening up front is already eliminating people before you even get to um, you know, your interview stage or your evaluation stage. And what about the legality? So maybe it's a Naveen question. Is it legal to ask people to self-identify so we can report back to the funders? So um, I'm gonna, as a lawyer, I'm gonna give you a legal uh, qualifier in that I'm not giving you legal advice. <laughs> um, what's important though, is that uh, whether, whether it's training, uh, whether it's uh, an assessment, whether it's a survey, is that these are all voluntary. Um, and what you have to do as an organization, and they go, oh, if it's voluntary, we get 30% of the people who respond. Again, the, the, it comes back to leaders need to lead. Then you haven't built the culture where people feel safe enough. And you haven't built the credibility where they feel psychologically safe enough to respond to this survey. If you, if you do the heavy lifting to try and build that at the forefront, you can have a higher rate of response. And, and we've seen it, you know, we've seen that in our assessments where organizations where leaders are taking fundamental steps. But if you just go, tell us where you're at, tell, give, give some information about yourself. Like how Census Canada shows up every little while, every few years and goes, here's some information. Unless you can trust how that information is gonna be used, where it's gonna be shared, is it really, uh, anonymous, anonymous? Is it going to be stored with a third party? Is my supervisor going to see it? Unless you can start to deal with all of that. Like if, if, if you, if you're from the LGBTQ community and you deal with, you've dealt with homophobia in that workplace, you're not coming out to them. Even if you've been out to the rest of the world, you're not going to bring that forward. So what's really important is you've got to do the culture build and then you're going to see those numbers go up. But since it's voluntary, you're going to get a low response. And funders, you know, uh, investors as well, VCs, they want that information. But it's a, it's a poor mark if you can't provide that information because people aren't self-identifying because you haven't done the heavy lifting. Uh, Lucy, do you have another question? Uh, we do, but you probably want to address it. So uh, please continue and I'll jump in. Oh, you, you can go because uh, okay. I, I see a, I see a lot of questions there. Yeah. They're, they're good so, ones. So yeah. So there's a shift, and uh, the next question it's related to the product per se. Uh, so when it comes to DNI on the creative side, how do you respond to writers, creators who perpetuate certain cultural stereotypes 
Using the argument of story and then the trickle down effect to casting where actors are so often asked to put on accents, whether they identify with that culture, people or not. And the other question we had that was similar is uh, how does the fight against racism and equal rights contribute to the intellectual and financial growth of game companies? So product base. Who wants to jump for that one? Marsha, I feel you want to say something. No, I was just going to say, I, I don't really, I haven't been really embedded in that process um, mm -hmm. with our uh, client team. Um, but I mean, just as a general overarching statement, I know both coming out of our studio and um, with our content team is really, and I don't think this will be uh, unfamiliar to anyone, but just, you know, casting authentically, right? And making sure that we have um, a match between who it is that, um, you know, is, for example, um, behind the voice um, and the character that has been created. So, um, you know, I, I, I can't speak to other people's experiences of, you know, being asked to put on an accent, but um, that's for sure something that we would want to stay away from and making sure that we're being authentic so that we can connect authentically with um, our audiences. That's great. Dion or Naveen, do you want to add to it? Good. All right. Well, I want to go back to um, the the questions I had er earlier um, about what can people do uh, to make sure that um, executive uh, decision makers can, um, you know, implement uh, you know, and I and I know Naveen, you 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 gave your your answer. Um, we'd love to hear it from uh, from Marsha and Leon if you can. Just as you know, as a um, an employee, how can you? What is the impact, or what can you do uh, to make sure that there's there's changes or implementation? Do you want to go, Leon? Sure, I can go. I think it's all about communication. Um, I think whatever you do, any initiative that you do, make sure that you communicate on it. Make sure that you base the communication on facts and share that around, share that with your team. That's how we also do it for the Black Game Pros Mixer. Um, and at the same time, I think as an organization, I mean, you need to allow your people to do these kind of things, do these kind of initiatives. And with that, get inspired by them. Um, so yeah, for, for me, I really think it's like I said, it's, it's all about it's all about communication as per usual. It's it's about okay, how if you do these things and if you see the impact and if you see the positive impact of the initiative that you are uh, trying to roll out, um, share that information. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I would add, um, a lot of what Naveen said um, just really resonated with me. I find this uh, question particularly tough. Um, if you are in an underrepresented group, um, and I'm conflicted because I, I, I feel that it is not one person's job. Um, it certainly can't be one person who is an underrepresented group's job to carry this forward and convince their leadership team that um, focusing on diversity and inclusion is important. I don't think that's a burden they need to take on. Um, but if you choose to be courageous, because um, that's, I think, what it takes is being courageous and, and you still want to move forward. I would say um, yes to Naveen's point, you know, make sure you're educated. Um, I think helping to bring data to leadership teams is helpful. But if you're, you're not even sure if you can get in front of an executive team member, I would say look for support, um, look for allies um, who feel the same way you do. You could float the question and just say, hey, you know, you know, this has been on my mind. I've been reading the news. This has been on my mind. How do you feel about it? And, and yes, it's not one person's job, but perhaps if more people feel the same, then you can then approach, you know, a manager, someone in a more senior role to you um, and get them on board and then move forward together um, to try and um, get in front of that executive team. That's great. Um, so, uh, Lucy, I don't know if you have other questions um, from the public that you want to go through and I want to make sure also that I have uh, enough time. So uh, something that you've all addressed, but uh, someone is asking, where do you look for diverse talent? Uh, so where do you go? 
Um, I guess what I would say, um, and we still have a lot of work to do just as, as far as um, understanding, um, you know, the type of talent that is in different areas of our business. Um, you know, I, it's safe to say, you know, in our human resources team, for example, we have very few people who identify as male. Um, so I think it's, you know, being strategic in what talent are you looking for in different areas of your business. Um, and then just, I think a lot of research and, um, you know, we're hoping to uh, build kind of an outreach strategy of once we identify what groups um, that we know we need to focus on is doing the research and building relationships um, within those communities, within those associations. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a huge resource um, because there's a lot of groups and associations there. Um, and then just putting yourself out there. And that's, again, to the point that I think, you know, everyone has said before, why what's happening inside of your organization is so important um, because yeah, that talent has to want to be there um, as well. So I would start there. I think heavy research and, and building relationships and rapport with those groups. Thank you. Anybody else want to answer that uh, question or? I, mean, I, I can speak on how we curate sure. talent, talent for the Black Game Pros Mixer. With, because when we started, we were like, okay, we need a pool of talented Black professionals within the industry that are not only Ubisoft. And that's how we came to the conclusion as well, that there is not this global network of, of Black people out there that work in the gaming industry. Like, okay, where to look, where to start? So then you just, basically, I just did my, my Google research, like, okay, Black folks within the gaming industry and started from there. I mean, and from that you start building, if you, but you need to start somewhere. And um, yeah, for me or for us, that worked quite well. I mean, so far we've had six mixers and I think all of them, we've kind of like, this started reaching out to people and be like, hey, would you like to join? Do you think that what you're doing is cool? Would you like to speak on this? And the only one of the question is, okay, so when is the next one? Because today was awesome. Well, thank you very much, first and foremost. Uh, we are working on the next one, um, but I'm also working on some other things, so um, priorities, priorities. However, I mean, I know that there is, uh, there was also, I think, a question regarding the the, the apprenticeship that we're offering. I think that this afternoon, actually, uh, at the career fair, I'm just reading a message, by the way, at the career fair at 4 p.m. your time, so Toronto time, uh, Eileen Wang will be there to talk about offering internships to Black students that are enrolled in an Ontario school. So if you're in the neighborhood at the career fair, go check it out, go go scope out Eileen. She's, she's cool people, uh, talk to her, and you might have an apprenticeship within Ubisoft. Boom. Cool, cool. Lucy, I think you have uh, more questions uh, in the Q&A. Do you want to go over them? Uh, I, I, I want to, but I also want you to uh, continue. It's up to you. What do you want to do, Charlie? Do yeah, well, well I, I went through all my uh, my wonderful questions for the panel. So uh, so um, okay. I'm, I'm really happy for you to, you know, go to the public, the, uh, the, the questions from the public. All right, so uh, some of them have already been addressed in some ways, but it's worth uh, repeating them. So how do you handle diversity hires regarding LGBTQ plus people, especially trans people, without putting them at risk of more discrimination or outing them if they are not comfortable, comfortable with that? Uh, I'd love to start on that I, one thing is this this i think it's important is this concept of diversity hires you know when i um went to law school uh i was uh i was supposed to actually go to med school med school I was supposed to become a doctor but <laughs> no i definitely wasn't smart enough for that and so I, I i you know i got into law school i did i did really well in my undergrad and i just i got in and i remember being at a um an event one night and and one, uh, one of the law students said, so you're here because of your wrong guy. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? Because you're here because you're, di you're like a diversity student, right? And so this, this idea that companies are just bringing people on board and they have, addressing the question that they have these diversity hires um, really sucks the life out of all of the lived experience, expertise, hard work that people from equity seeking groups have put into those 
uh, those positions. You know, this is not even affirmative action in, in the 60s in the US didn't do this. This idea that people are fully incompetent, but we're going to give them a job anyways. And somehow this idea between merit and diversity, these are, these are dueling concepts. So this, even the language of diversity hire uh, is very problematic, right? People are skilled, but historically those skilled people don't get acknowledged. And so what we're doing, some organizations are doing now is let's start to take off those blinders. Let's start to see the people who, for people in front of us for who they are, what skills they bring to the workplace. And sometimes those aren't traditional skills that say a white straight man might bring to the, to the position, but they'll bring a whole bunch of other skills. And so when we're able to do that, we don't have these concepts called diversity hires. We just hire people and we ensure that we build an environment where they can thrive. If certain groups aren't thriving, there's a systemic problem. If certain groups aren't thriving, you have, you know, if, if uh, BIPOC folks aren't thriving, you have a systemic racism problem, it's simple as that. So that's before I get to the question. So the question, the question itself, I think speaks to um, uh, the, uh, let me just find the question. Uh, you know, Lucy, could you, uh, uh, could you mind repeating the question? Yeah, it's uh, basically about how do you not discriminate further LGBTQ plus people, especially trans people, Yes. Uh, that are at risk of being outed when they don't choose to be outed. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and this, this goes back to the original uh, notion of, you know, if we're going to collect demographic data on, on groups and people, some people just aren't out, uh, some people, um, you know, who are trans, just, they, they want to be recognized and they identify as, as a woman. Not necessarily, not some, some people will not even recognize as a trans woman. I am just a woman or I, I, am, I am a man. Um, and so the key here is that it goes back to the culture build. If you have a culture where they feel comfortable to say, I'm out, I'm, I'm comfortable being out. I'm comfortable being recognized as someone who was born biologically X and is now no longer biologically X. That's where you're going to get those responses. But the other side of that coin is you can't have an expectation that people are going to, uh, and this is how complicated it is, you can't have an expectation that, that trans folks or, or people from the, or from the LGBTQ community are just going to come out. And if they don't come out and they don't self-identify, it's on them. It's not on the company culture because it's always on the company culture. Leaders have to lead. And I think you uh, did address one of the questions we have here. Uh, and the person apologizes in advance uh, because he's not sure he's asking, he's using the, the words he wants to, uh, to ask a question, but uh, how do you strike a balance between the emphasis on diversity without ignoring uh, the fact that white people also are job candidates? Uh, so, and again, you know, uh, apologies for phrasing the question. Yeah. I mean, I think just to Naveen's point, you're you're looking for qualified candidates. Um, and I, I think when you look at um, internally and why there are so few people in executive roles, um, you know, from underrepresented groups, um, that's because there have been barriers along the way. So I, I don't think, um, you know, in focusing your efforts or changing the way that you source, um, you know, is to, you know, not allow, um, you know, white people to advance. Um, you know, it's just in um, helping to create that balance um, where people have been held back in the past. And Marcia, that one uh, would be for you. Uh, one of the question is the person feels that large corporations are only interested in black talent during History Black Month. Uh, so how do you feel about that? Do you think it's the case and how could corporations manage this perception better? Um, I mean, I can't speak for all organizations. Um, I, I hope organizations are just not looking for black talent during Black History Month. Um, I think I would start there. Um, 
And I think just overall, uh, you know, there is a lot of focus and emphasis, I think, again, on um, gender and race as areas of diversity. Um, and, and at Wild Brain, we're trying to, to focus on all the areas of diversity. So I, I think once we're in a better position where we've collected data and we can see in different parts of our business, because it is different, um, you know, where are the areas where we have, where we have less representation and, and focus there? Um, you know, it, it's, it's not just going to be gender and, and, or race, um, you know, we're, we're looking to make sure that as a whole organization that we're representative of the, the communities in which we operate and in, in which we live in. That's really our goal um, is that you don't walk into work and you feel um, that that environment is much different than, you know, when you step outside, um, you know, for lunch or, you know, within your community. And that one is for Naveen, I think. Uh, how do you create measurable KPIs? Uh, it seems to be often based on size of company. However, the game industry is still in its infancy when it comes to attracting diverse candidates. Uh, Renee is saying that they have started doing events and presentations at the high school levels to create an interest prior to students getting to college. In the meantime, how can they measure their ongoing efforts. Sure. Um, the one of the you know there's there's different KPIs. The 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 sort of um, surface level KPI that companies say, hey, we use we use metrics. The metric is demographics. We've got so many people from this group, so many people from this group. That's the entry point. That's the starting point. We just want to know what we look like as an organization. Measuring culture is so fundamentally important. And it's, it's also wrought with a whole bunch of landmines, the ways in which we ask the questions. Is it on a Likert scale so that people can game the questions? Are they, um, are they able to, uh, when we start to look at culture, are we, are we pulling in information and data that, has, that is, is not just qualitative, qualitative data is important as well, but is quantitative. Can we measure certain behavioral characteristics uh, over time, right? Not personality, right? Personalities are very, personalities and diversity and inclusion really don't mix because personalities are rather static. Behaviors are malleable, right? As an employer, I don't care what you do outside this workplace. I have a certain expectation of you and how you operate in this workplace. That's behavior. And we can measure those behaviors. Again, going back to the original analogy, we can measure your intent, the way you want to act, and the way you do. I want to work out. I uh, haven't been to the gym in three years. So we want to be able to connect those two so that people have a very clear road, right? KPIs, uh, you know, um, KPIs are, are, are key performance indicators. But again, going back to the idea of rigor, if we're not applying the same degree of scientifically validated rigor to DNI, it does often feel like this is, you know, we're event coordinators. We're from one event to the next to the next. And that's why, you know, you know, after February 28th, what happened to all the black folks? What happened to black events? But an organization that is concentrating on anti-oppression continually, understanding that to address a systemic problem, such as anti-Black racism, you need a systematized approach. It can't just be this patchwork of things that make us feel good in the moment. So that we're actually, we're actually doing that, that culture building. If we're going to use those, those KPIs, what are those KPIs? What behavioral characteristics are we actually measuring? And then once we have the data, are we providing people with a roadmap to move forward and better themselves on those behaviors? And this is a, a segue to the last question. Because there are many people in the industry, they want to do a good job at diversity and inclusion. Uh, and they have different initiatives. How do they start and make sure that the way they plan their initiative is sustainable and they can continue and improve year after year. So how do they start and sustain the effort for results? 
I think it's okay to ask for help. We certainly have um, worked with uh, two different consultants. Um, so I'll start there. Um, and I think really before you uh, implement an initiative or I think you should be starting then to think through whether what you're about to implement is something that you can sustain. Um, and if not, I mean, I would, I would caution you on starting that because that's where you get to the point where it feels like just a checkbox if it, it can't be sustainable long-term. Yeah, no, for sure. I think the, it, and I would add that if you're starting an initiative, you know, where you need to know what your starting point is. And that, that involves, um, that idea of measurement. You know things are bad, but how how bad are they? And then where do we need uh, where do we need to get to? Like even you know bringing on expertise. Like I, I'm a, a a big fan of the idea that passion alone will not decrease human suffering, will not decrease racism, because there's a lot of good people out there uh, who want to do good things. There's people who want to be great allies, people who are passionate about it. But unless we have a again, a scientifically valid, a systematic way of driving this forward. Um, uh, we don't get there on passion alone because we, there's a lot of passionate people out there. And our behaviors don't change simply from listening to one or two passionate people. It's about driving that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the other piece that I would add with regard to, um, you know, for small companies, you know, the, you know, we deal, for instance, we, I'm not going to plug us, but we deal with a, with a, a lot, we deal with a number of tech companies. Uh, some of them are small startups. Uh, like we're, we're a company of 17. That makes us one of Canada's largest d &I companies, <laughs> emerging industry. And so uh, we deal with a number of startups and those startups, you know, use, utilizing technology are able to actually build those skills over time. So you want to look for those those opportunities. If your leadership is really committed and, and new startups, especially, where we see this all the time, where they're younger, younger leadership, younger founders, younger uh, VCs investing them, you know, having requirements of what they expect of these, these companies. Um, they're able to actually engage in ways in which they start to build, do that culture build from the ground up. Like you don't, you don't want to be doing this for 15 years and your billion dollar company go, ah, we regret the DNI piece, you know. We, we still got the bro culture from Silicon Valley. You want to do this as a, as a, whether you're a startup or you're a scale up, you want to do this from, from the get go. So when you're, you're five people, how do we build this culture? So it is an inclusive one. So it is psychologically safe. There's this concept um, for those of you, and I just talked about all these great young people coming up and I'm going to use an old person example. There used to be this movie called um, field of dreams, Kevin Costner, basically, in the movie, he builds, a, he builds a baseball diamond so a whole bunch of ghosts of old baseball players come to the day of baseball diamond. It's, it's a decent movie. And so, you know, he hears a voice and he's in a cornfield in like Iowa and he hears a voice and the voice says, build it and they will come. And so he builds it. Unless you build that, and that's a perfect analogy for unless you build that culture from the ground up, then people from diverse groups see that, they hear about it. And today's, in the communication available today, they will know this is a place you apply to, this is a place you don't apply to. When they go to your website, we, you can go to anyone's website and know what they're doing on DNI. They'll, you'll know by the faces you see. You'll know what their commitment is to building a culture where you can thrive. And if you, you know, where do we find these people? They're not hiding in anyone's basement, they're there. Right? The gaming industry has to ask the question is, have you started to build a culture where uh, black, uh, black folks think it's okay for me to be part of that industry? And unless you build that culture, they're gonna, this, is, this isn't a spot for me. This is great. Um, we're almost out of time and um, it was a really great conversation. Um, I would like to, uh, before, um, you know, giving the final words uh, to Lucy, um, just maybe a last word from, from each of you, if there's anything that you want to add to the conversation. Again, an amazing conversation today. Um, Leon, maybe? I mean, I feel super inspired just listening to Marsha and Naveen. And this is, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's very, I mean, I'm, I'm based out of Amsterdam. I mean, I don't live in Ontario. I don't really know the struggles that are going on in, in Canada or, but I'm happy to see that 
we're, I mean, at least I'm not alone. I mean, that we're all in this together to try to make a change. And I think that's what will in the end uh, um, actually drive change. All of us coming together, working together and pushing this, this agenda that we have forward of, of and it's an, it's a normal, again, it's a normal thing to add for more diversity in the industry. That's a normal thing. And I think that people like yourself, like Naveen, Marsha, Caldwin, uh, the fact that you are all doing these kind of things or interactive Ontario, I mean, this is, it needs to start somewhere. And these kind of initiatives are being watched by leadership. They know what's going on. And I think that the more we keep on doing these things, the more we will be able to influence the actual change that we want to see. Great. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think I would only add, um, you know, it's, it's great that there are these spaces to have conversations. Dialogue is so important. Um, and the more that we kind of normalize that, it'll get easier and easier. I would, I guess my last word is just be, don't be discouraged if you haven't started yet or your organization hasn't started yet. Um, you have to start somewhere. Everybody, every company started somewhere um, and it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and I think um, like Naveen, I stress and stress and stress the culture piece. Um, again, that's something that is an on, ongoing work. We all say we actually don't think we're going to arrive anywhere. Like it's going to be constant work. Um, but if you do the right things day in, day out, um, you know, the outcome over time, um, you know, you'll get there. Perfect. Naveen, last words? Very quickly, I, I, one, I just want to thank uh, all of you. Your immense amount of skill and expertise. Uh, it's been a lovely experience for me, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Interactive Ontario for putting this together. Uh, very thoughtful um, and a very thoughtful uh, team that you have uh, there working with you, Lucy. Um, you know, to those entering the um, the gaming industry working in it right now like you know if you whether you're from the lgbtq community you're a woman you're um, uh, from the bipoc community you're one of those intersectionalities we all stand on the shoulders of, of of giants right people who came before who you know made the road allowed this conversation uh, to happen so you know i think while to to um the people entering the industry it might seem tough, um, but you, you, know, you have all the resources in the world. And this idea of there's social power, you have that power and that ability to communicate and connect. And that alone is going to drive the changes that your industry needs. And you have this great stage. You're affecting the lives of millions of people. Representation matters. So only great things ahead. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Marsha. It was really insightful and uh, yeah, really appreciate uh, your time today. So I'm going to you know, pass uh, the mic to Lucy and uh, she's going to say the final words. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. So Carl Edwin, Leon, Marsha, Naveen, and all of the great questions of the participant. And uh, as Marsha said, I think we need also to be very comfortable to ask for help. Uh, so that's one takeaway from this discussion. And uh, I cannot stress enough how important this talk was, uh, very insightful and timely. Thank you to our keynote partners, Ontario Creates, the Canada Media Fund, the Bell Fund, and Ubisoft Toronto. And Carl Edwin, you did mention earlier on the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services of Ontario. Uh, they are our partner with Ubisoft Toronto for the career fair that is happening now uh, for emerging Black professional and students. So if you're registered and you haven't done so yet, it's very important. Please set up your profile and book the meetings uh, with employers and the employers with uh, the candidates. Uh, so again, thank you. That was very important. Good day to all. Bye. Bye, everyone.